Good morning. I want to welcome each of you to worship today with Covenant Presbyterian Church. If I've not met you before, my name is Thomas. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are glad that you're with us. We're a community that's encouraging one another to follow Jesus wherever we live, work, and play. And no matter who you are, no matter what's been going on in your life this week, no matter if you're here in the sanctuary or joining us via our live stream today, we are one worshiping community, and it is our joy that we can be together this day. Friends, on the back of the bulletin or on the website, there are several different announcements about things that are coming up in the life of this church. We are starting next week a four-week teaching series that I am really uh, looking forward to. We have some time between uh, Easter and Memorial Day this year and looking forward to that journey. And we hope that you will um, uh, join us as we begin this four-week series next week. Also, I really want to encourage you, if you're here today uh, in, on campus, to, to take some time after the service to visit some of the tables on the patio. There's opportunities, as we heard last week, about if you're interested in learning about uh, a, a relationship with our sister church in Cuba and being part of a, a trip next fall or learning about it. Uh, there's also a chance if you are interested in uh, really leaning towards your own spiritual growth to be a part of our uh, next round of formation cohorts. Uh, it's a nine month process that I cannot recommend highly enough. And there are people who have been through that program that are out on the patio at another table today. These are ways that you can be thinking about your own growth as well as how we are a part of serving this world. There's so much more going on in the back of your bulletin with uh, courageous conversation next week uh, and uh, at a really important moment in the life of this country. And we hope that you will continue to engage with us as we join God and what God's doing here in Austin and beyond. So again, friends, it's my joy today to welcome you. I invite all who are able to stand and join in our call to worship. We live in the radiance of your glory. Our worship comes gladness you have put in our hearts. We give you thanks for the peace of your salvation. Let us worship God.
seated. And I would invite you, if you have empty chairs in your row, to go ahead and move toward the aisle, please. That would be helpful. We've got some folks looking for seats. We cannot flee from God. If we ascend to the highest heights or dive to the deepest steps, still God is there and finds us, surrounding us with love and mercy. We are safe then, friends, to make our confession, to be fully honest, to come before a holy God in order to find grace. Let us now make our confession together as a community, first in silent prayer. Gracious God, we are creatures of dust, ignorant of your revelation, misunderstanding your life, death, and resurrection among us, needing forgiveness. We repent of our failure to give as you have given to us. We beg your mercy for our fallen world. We seek your word that we may live with the faith of Jesus. Be our solace in this life and always. We ask this as your own children, holy and incomplete. Forgive us and lead us. Amen. God's word to us from Colossians, the first chapter. God has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Brothers and sisters, through the saving work of Christ the King, we have been granted pardon. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven, and so am I. Hallelujah and amen. Let's stand and rejoice. given us peace through Christ, so let us share a greeting of, of peace to one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Share the peace. Oh, look at there's a cough drop. There we go. Peace, good Christ, morning. Good Peace morning. of Christ. Ah. 
I want to be in the room where it happens, the room where it happens. I want to be in the room where it happens, the room where it happens. Some of you are looking mystified. Others of you are familiar with the, the Broadway musical Hamilton. That little piece comes in a larger tune that Lin-Manuel Miranda, the, the composer and, and writer of the script, uh, said is his favorite of the songs. And he always rude that he gave it not to his character, Alexander Hamilton, but to uh, Aaron Burr's character, uh, played by Leslie Odom Jr. And, and I start with it this morning because in that case, Burr wanted political power and he knew where it was happening. He knew the room where it was happening and he wasn't in there. Alexander Hamilton had been in there a while and he was jealous, he was, he was smart, Aaron Burr, and he was, he was ambitious, but he hadn't been in the room where it happened. So this song features his craving to be in there and actually have a finger on the wheels of, of power. But you and I know that there are a lot of rooms where it happens, right? A couple weeks ago, Caitlin Clark brought her best go to the championship game against South Carolina, Iowa, South Carolina, in the women's NCAA basketball championship, and people paid $2,500 to $3,000 just to get into the room where that happened. Today's the Masters, five years ago. So we got Caitlin here, and we got Tiger here. Five, five years ago, on this day, by the way, Tiger Woods had more power than he has now. He hadn't been in an accident and ruined the rest of his body. And, and he was in the hunt, and people were paying $20,000 to get in on the final day. We know, and sometimes we'll even pay to be in the room or the course where it, where it happens, because we know how important those are, but there are some we wouldn't trade money for, right? Birth of the first child. The first kid in the family to go to college, walking the stage and throwing the tassel, tassel across and getting the diploma. We know in those rooms where it happens that there are ones that are too, too important to have money as a consideration. This morning, after two weeks of saying, Christ is risen, after two weeks of saying Christ is risen, he's risen indeed. After the party that we had on Easter Sunday morning, the celebration, almost pep rally for Jesus' resurrection. And then last week, Whitney bringing this glorious good news that resurrection didn't just happen. It also, as Thomas had, had said the week before differently, it also matters because Jesus finds us and restores us and sends us all of this great news. And we're riding high. And today I get to be the scratch in the vinyl. I get to be the guy who slows the roll because eventually we get to Thomas the Apostle who is, favor, or who is famously called Doubting Thomas. For two weeks, we've been living in the euphoria of Easter. But you and I know that in ourselves lie nagging parts of us that are saying, I'm not sure. In fact, if we had a, you know what a Geiger counter is? It's where it, if it gets near radioactivity, it really beeps and clicks and stuff. If we had a doubtometer in here, it would, it would click in a lot of places. And as we came into the room today, we may have thought that a demerit. We may have thought, Jesus doesn't like doubt. We ought to ask our question, what does Jesus think of doubt? And then after that, we ought to ask, well, in light of what Jesus thinks of doubt, what should a church look like, look like if it's the body of Christ when it sees doubt? What would, what would a group of Christians look like to reflect what we are, whatever we find out about what Jesus thinks of doubt? And then thirdly, and this may be where the rubber meets the road for all of us, what should one do with one's doubts? It's a season of hallelujahs. It's hard to sing the minor key song. But what should one do with one's doubts? Now, we're going to read the scripture now, and we're going to meet Doubting Thomas in all his, of his insistence on seeing and feeling. And we're going to remember that Thomas and Whitney both put us in the room where it happens, and Thomas was not there. And so 
we meet the disciples just after Jesus has come and just after he's said, peace be with you, and just after he's given the Holy Spirit to them, Let's listen together for the word of God as it comes to us from John chapter 20, verses 24 through 31. But Thomas, who was also called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came, not in the room where it happened. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hands in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to Thomas, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that aren't written in this book, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We don't know why Thomas went out of the room. Did he go to get groceries? Sneak a cigarette? We don't know why Thomas was out of the room. The Gospel of John doesn't seem to be interested in that. The big issue is that he's out of the room. And if we had stopped midway through that reading, Thomas and his demanding, I will not believe until this and this and this, his demands without negotiation, if we had just stopped there, how would you have thought Jesus should re-enter the room? Because I got all kinds of feeling that Jesus could easily have come in and said, Thomas, how dare you? I've been with you three years. We've walked uphill and down. We've been through this excruciating week. And I come and visit the rest of them. And they tell you I'm risen. And you will not believe. How dare you? This is insulting. That would be an option for Jesus. It would be an option for Jesus not even to show up again. Thomas is there, but he's already been there once. He doesn't need to come back. Jesus doesn't need to come back just to cater to Thomas's little demand. But what does Jesus do? He does none of those shaming or ignoring things. He comes in the room and he says, here. Here, put your hand in. Feel the place where I was wounded. This is such a good painting, Caravaggio, about 1600. And you can see that Jesus isn't looking angry. He's looking sort of compassionate, almost wounded with Thomas. Jesus chooses to welcome Thomas's doubt, and I see that as sort of an upset victory. How many of you would have come into the room thinking that doubt for a Christian person is a demerit? I sure would have. Doubt seems like a demerit. It seems like one of those things that people who haven't quite, quite caught up have. So we, maybe you haven't been to church enough, or maybe you haven't this, or maybe you haven't that. Have you been going to Bible study? Have you been, right? We could think of a lot of reasons why somebody would come short on what we would call robust faith, and they all seem to point to unfavorable approval ratings. Right? Doubt is bad. It's something you're not not have, it gets in the way of faith, but Jesus doesn't think that of Thomas. And lo and behold, there's another story where it may be even more shocking who's doing the doubting. And this one isn't as well known as the Easter story of Thomas. This one comes to John the Baptist. What do we associate John the Baptist with? John the Baptist is the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. He's wearing camel's hair and leather, and he's, he's this wild-eyed, wild-haired guy who is shouting out by the Jordan, 
repent, and he's saying things like, one who is coming after me, Jesus, is mightier than I am. I am not fit to untie his sandals. I baptize you with water. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is ready. And listen closely here, because this is John the Baptist saying what Jesus is going to be like. His winnowing fork is ready. He will separate the wheat from the chaff. The wheat will go in the barn. That's the good people. The chaff will be burned with unquenchable fire. What kind of picture is John painting of Jesus? Powerful, judging, ruler who's going to roll heads and make the mighty evil ones come down and bring the righteous few up. John's picture is of somebody who turns the world on its, on its head and changes these things. And then Jesus comes and says, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And he sets up a hospital in Galilee. And, ta- and John the Baptist, in the meantime, gets thrown in the clink, gets thrown in the dungeon by a petty dictator named Herod, who is tired of John criticizing his love life. I mean, this is People magazine stuff, right? He's tired of John criticizing his love life, so he says, I'll be done with him. And then there's a, this, this sort of back and forth between his wife and his girlfriend, all these things. And and John is thrown in a dungeon. The guy who was drawing huge crowds at the Jordan River, who had expected Jesus was going to make all this right, is in the dungeon. And here's the passage where he finally sounds out his frustration. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? This is John the Baptist. There's no way we would have expected this. He spits when he talks. He's a guy who is so enthused and so all fired sure of who Jesus is that he baptizes him and then says everything's going to change. But everything hasn't changed in the way that he expected. Jesus isn't the guy he expected. So he says, are you the one or should we keep on looking? That's an audacious question. Again, it's in Jesus' bag of of tricks to say, how dare you, John? How dare you insult me in front of a crowd? Because that's the disciples talking to Jesus when he's speaking, and look at what Jesus does. Jesus told them, go back to John and tell him what you've heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. I don't know if you have a a concording, comprehensive memory of the book of Isaiah. But that is like a quick journey through high spots in Isaiah that John's vision of Jesus didn't include. John expected the fiery one, and there's that in the book of Isaiah. Jesus answers back, look around. All these things are happening, John. I know you love Isaiah. Check the verses I'm the guy, and then he says something so loving. And he added, and God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. Do you see the compassion in that? Jesus is saying, I know you're not what, what, I know I'm not what you expected. I know I'm not the guy you thought I'd be, John, but I am the guy, and blessed are you if that doesn't scandalize you, if that doesn't send you away. This is respect for a prophet from Jesus when the prophet has just thrown down the glove at him. Friends, I don't know what parts of Scripture surprise you, but these are two of them for me. Jesus risen from the dead saying, Thomas, here, I'll come to your doubt. I'll come to to offer myself to you. Jesus sending a message back to a disappointed John and saying, I'm the one, I'm not what you expected Please stay on board. The compassion that leaks from that tells me that what Jesus thinks of doubt is that it is not a demerit. In fact, he treats it with a good deal of respect because these two people are trying to get to truth, trying to get to who Jesus is, trying to get to faith. Now, there is a kind of doubt, let's just remember, 
There is a kind of doubt that looks different than that, different than Thomas's, different than John's. It's a kind of doubt that sort of swirls around the question. You've recognized people like this. You may be a person like this. I have been at times in my life who sits in the corner and asks the very learned question. He says, uh, but have you considered this about the resurrection? Have you considered this about Jesus' ministry? And it seems that they're always asking the question mainly to be superior to us others who don't know as much. And they keep just asking. This is not doubt that is seeking Jesus. This is doubt that is seeking status. That's not the kind Jesus answers in these two cases. There is a backward moving doubt. But Jesus is seeing Thomas and John the Baptist, and he knows they want to know. He knows they want to go forward with him. He's just trying to answer their doubt. And so, Alfred Lord Tennyson seems to me to be pretty near where Jesus is when he writes in memoriam to one of his friends, there lives more faith in honest doubt, believe me, than in half of the creeds. All those times when we say we believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, he's saying half the creeds don't have as much faith as an honest, robust doubter. Now how do you feel about the Geiger counter? It's not such a bad thing, right? Not such a bad thing to have beeping going on. And the other thing about Jesus that I notice here is that he doesn't seem threatened by their questions. Being threatened by questions is a weak position. Jesus is pretty sure of himself. So he's perfectly willing to answer Thomas. He's perfectly willing to answer John the Baptist, not with dismissiveness, but with hope they will come along. It's a strong position. So if Jesus is okay with doubt, in fact, he welcomes it when it's expressed at its highest level in these two people, then the next question becomes, what does a church look like that actually follows Jesus in this? Now, church history is not stellar on this. You've heard the word inquisition, right? Inquisition, do you believe in Jesus Christ the Son? Uh, not yet. Okay, we'll put your thumbs in screws. And then, do you believe in Jesus? And then we'll put you in the racks. And then they were torturing in order to get faithful statements out of people. There have been bad seasons in our history, and there are bad versions right now of the church lady who's sitting in judgment and saying who's in and who's out. The church doesn't have a great track record, but what would a church look like that followed this Jesus, that embodied this Jesus? Well, I know there would be space for questions, right? There would be space for honest questions, and nobody would be saying, oh, you don't know that Bible verse. <laughs> there wouldn't be this sort of status of knowledge. There would be hope for gain. Wherever anybody is on the journey, this is one of the ways that we welcome you on Sundays. Wherever anybody is on the journey, we're for them and for moving the journey on together. A church that embraces the Jesus who welcomes Thomas and John the Baptist is a church that opens itself to be a love letter to skeptical Austin, to be a love letter to anyone who doubts and could otherwise feel like they don't belong because of that. Friends, churches change when we realize the compassion and grace of Jesus toward people who doubt. And then comes this third question, because this is good news to the Geiger counter people. If Jesus embraces and welcomes doubt, and if Jesus is willing to make his church into a place where doubt can reside faithfully, where doubt can be the other, the flip side of faith. What do we do with ours? What do we do with our faith or with our doubt? I have a good buddy. Uh, he started out as a student when I was uh, teaching as a graduate assistant. He was in my uh, section, my, my preceptorial, and, and he was the smartest guy in the room, and it was clear, and I found out that he was this hardcore lawyer from Horgan and Hartson in Washington, never lost a litigation case, one of the smartest people I had ever met, and he came in having had a spiritual crisis but not really knowing where faith was going to take him, and he was hard-boiled. And he came and he asked those questions that are a little annoying, right? 
He asked those questions that are kind of picky when everybody else was moving forward. And I began to see this guy has the potential for a kind of faith and a kind of movement forward that will be absolutely key to the way God's moving in the world. And so I just held my nose and answered his annoyances. And by the way, all the time he was putting up with the annoying people who were already Christian. Because I want you to picture Thomas for the week between the two Sundays. Jesus comes to the disciples while Thomas is out of the room. And he, he's, they say, he says, I'm here. And they say, he's risen. He's risen indeed. And then Thomas comes back and they say he's risen. And Tom, Thomas doesn't buy it. Do you know how annoying Christian certainty can be? They've probably made T-shirts and mugs already. He's risen. He's risen indeed. And Thomas says, I'm not sure. That's how Skip was, my student, who then became a pastor. And when he had grown, when he had stayed with the annoying people long enough, when he had sat with the church long enough and gone forward in faith, he became this powerful pastor. And he, he did these sessions for skeptical uh, New Canaan, Connecticut men and women. And he said, you guys got to dig in. You got to move toward because if you want to get hit by a train, you got you to lie down on the tracks. Right? Skip discerned that if I'm going to find God, I have to go toward the people who seem already to be with him. However annoying that might be, I need to go toward the people just as Thomas stayed. And it is very hard to be among the hallelujah people when you don't have a song. But there's Thomas a week later, and there's Skip Masbach putting up with the annoying seminary students. And there we are asking, how can I make my doubt available in ways that move me forward? Well, it turns out we go toward the church. And here's the reason. Jesus doesn't even flinch at your doubt. Here's the last of my passages. I'm a Bible geek, so we get a lot of these. This is from Matthew 28, fairly familiar passage. The great commission of Jesus to his disciples once he's risen. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but they doubted. Now, risen Jesus is standing right there. And they're saying, well, we aren't sure. How crazy is that? You would think that Jesus would do a little HR work and go to Indeed and say, I need a little more faithful people in order to get what I want to get done done in the world. But look what's next. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You, 11 people who are doubting me, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. I would have made a personnel change. Jesus knew that when you doubt, if you're a faithful doubter, we want you stepping forward. We want you sent, as Whitney said last week. We want you moving. He says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And here's the deal. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Friends, all of us doubt sometimes. Disciples who were looking Jesus in the eye risen Doubt sometimes. The church needs to be a place where Jesus can come and meet doubters, including you and me. So, how about we have faith together? And how about we doubt together? Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's rise and sing.
may be seated. Today we have the joy of ordaining and installing deacons and elders. The ministry of elders is one of spiritual discernment and governance. The ministry of deacons is one of compassion and service. Both are gifts to the church so that the ministry of the whole people of God may flourish. In ordination, the church sets apart with prayer and the laying on of hands, those who have been elected, called and elected through the church to serve as deacons and elders or ruling elders and teaching elders or, ministry or ministers. In installation, the church sets apart with prayer those previously ordained and called afresh to that ministry. So this is what we are now going to devote ourselves to, friends. So with great gratitude, I would invite now those who are in the class of 2027, elders and deacons, those who are present in the service, if you will please come forward and stand on the um, floor facing the congregation. would also in like to invite Elder Paige Harris to come forward too. friends. I'm going to let Paige get up. I am going to ask you the constitutional questions for you to be ordained and for you to be installed. There are quite a few questions, and I don't want, to, I don't want you guys to lose yourself in the question, <laughs> wondering, do I say I will or I do? So I will prompt you. So my great encouragement is for you to release that, to trust me, and to listen to the questions that you are saying yes to, to pay attention to the vows that you are making this morning. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior? Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do and will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by, your, by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? For ruling elders, will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? For deacons, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Paige. Do we, the members of the church, accept these ruling elders or deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation 
to lead us in the way of Jesus. Do you? Do. Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do you? We do. We do. turn up here. We're going to have a chance to uh, pray for all of you who are being ordained for the first time. Uh, and I want to invite anyone here who's been ordained as an elder or ordained as a pastor. If you all want to make your way forward, we'd love to have you. We're going to have a chance to, to pray for these folks, to, to lay hands on these folks. And, um, and if you are being ordained uh, for the first time into your office, I want you to move forward towards that, but don't kneel yet because you've got a shelf life on these steps as to how long you can survive. So you want to wait to the last moment. Um, but this is a chance, and for all of us who are here, to pray for these folks, to pray as they lead us and they serve us going forward. Uh, this is an important day and an important uh, calling that each of these folks have. Okay, I think we're a good enough place. If you're getting ordained, you can kneel. And I invite everyone to gather forward to lay your hands upon one of these folks or upon somebody who is closer. And for all of us together, let's join in prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks this day for these women and men. We give you thanks that you have called them to lead this congregation, to serve this congregation. We ask, Lord, for the anointing of your spirit to be upon each of them. These are uncertain times in an uncertain world where the church is needing to think about what it means and to discern what it means to be your beloved community in these days. With all that we see happening in the world and in this city and in this nation, in our families and our lives. So we ask, Lord, for your anointing to be upon these deacons, to help them to lead us in compassion and in service to this city and to one another, that you would lead and, and anoint these elders to discern your will for our congregation. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would give them a wisdom to know how to carry out the offices to which you have called them and to anoint them with a courage to lead us forward wherever it is they see you taking us. And as we go as a people... May it all be for your glory. So may your presence lay mightily upon these women and men now in the weeks, months, and years to come. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand, if you can. You can go back to your seats. And if all of us would give thanks to God for these folks and for their acceptance of the call. Friends, as an act of worship, we now have the opportunity to give back to God a por portion of what God has given to us through the collection of our weekly tithes and offerings. And so I invite the ushers to come forward, and for all of us, may we continue to worship God this day.
Lord, we give you thanks this day. You have blessed us in so many different ways. We ask that you would take these gifts, a small portion of what you have blessed us with, and that you would multiply them for the building up of your kingdom in our own lives, in the lives of those in this room, in the lives of those who are part of this worshiping community, in the life of the city, this nation, and this world. We pray all of this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
friends, I noticed that it is fan time of year. It is time when breeze feels good, and so I have a blessing for you and a charge. The blessing is that we do this church, we do this faith with a holy wind at our backs. The Holy Spirit supports all of our efforts, and the charge is let's be grace to doubters and let's seek grace as doubters. Let's be church. So go forth into the world in that grace, in that peace. Love and serve the Lord. Amen.